So the shipboard environment was um, very interesting. One of the big concerns we had was one rotor being over the deck and the other rotor essentially hanging over the side of the ship. And there's a lot of concern about the rotor interaction uh, with the downwash and the downwash affecting the uh, aircraft as it's trying to settle because one downwash is going right into the ocean and away, not a problem. The other one is bubbling underneath. Would that still be considered ground effect? Ground effect, yeah. Okay. So I was, I was going to actually ask you about that. Was there any we, noticeable... We did have some problems uh, and the nice thing about fly-by-wire, you can make corrections and, and that and some some changes were made. It wasn't always, it was a unique wind conditions that, that set it off and it was still controllable but not the optimum so we, we made some changes to the flight control system and, and that worked, worked well. Now they're operating aboard ship, no problems, no harm. Uh, one of the other things we got into was uh, the V-22 replacing uh, helicopters does external cargo. And one of the, the questions was, uh, okay, uh, let's let's see how we do this. So we, you know, you know, the CH-46 carries jeeps, small tractors, uh, water, and you know the trailer water canisters and uh, netted cargo, you know, anything, any piece of trash you can hang underneath a helicopter, you know, the helicopter is supposed to be able to pick it up and carry it. Right. <laughs> well, well, one of the real issues of, of that is, uh, is the thing you're carrying stressed to, to take the speed of the tumor. Ah, oh, okay. And, you know, most helicopters with an external cargo, you know, they're going 100 knots, maybe 90, 100, maybe. If it's a lighter cargo, maybe up to 110, but you know, not a problem. But tilt rotor, you know, 200 knots. You can go 200 knots with a, a jeep down there, you know. Yeah. And the, so the tie down points on the on the vehicles and the loads it became a big big issue. You know, had to do a lot of re-engineering. Uh, can, can that airplane go 200 knots with an external load? Yeah, yeah. really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, that's fast. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things, the unique things about the V-22 is that it has a uh, dual point uh, suspension. So it's got two hooks and not, not a big technology issue that other helicopters have that, but for the V-22 it's really important that you were, would do that. But one of the problems is, uh, if the hooks sense an imbalance in the weight, they have a safety feature in there to open the hooks and drop the load, because you're you're worried that you know one hook would release mm -hmm. the load and the other hook is still holding it, and you'd have a tremendous weight shift and uh, shock into the airframe. Okay. So, if, and that was something we had to to be concerned about because of the speed we're flying. All the weight became transferred to the forward hook, and the aft hook was not sensing any weight, so it would say, "We've got a failure here," and drop the load. So we went around and around about how to how to fix that and techniques for external cargo. After a period of time, we were lifting all kinds of oddball shapes and sizes and vehicles and stuff demonstrating that we could external uh, any anything that the uh, uh, helicopters could but always turned out that high speeds became a restriction on the load the airplane could do it could carry it but the loads were not stressed uh, to be flown at uh, at that speed, and when the loads couldn't be flown at that speed, that meant that they had they would have to go back and redesign the bumpers or redesign the attach points for for 
for a lot of the external cargoes. So the, the Humvee Jeeps and things like that, they, would, they weren't stressed to be flown at uh, 200 knots. Okay. And so now the V-22 can do more than the external cargo. So. With the nacelles in forward flight, what's your stall speed? Uh, it's uh, weight altitude dependent, but sure. it, you know, 60, 70 knots, a pretty low yes. wow. stall speed because it's a it's a symmetrical wing. It, right. It's not, not a real fancy wing. It's a very very symmetrical pilot wing. Yeah. Pilot wing, yeah, yeah, and uh, stalling V twenty two is is a non-event. Really? Yeah. You, know, you, you get a little buffet. I wish we had more buffet, but uh, you get a little buffet when the stall onset occurs. But, you know, you really got to be asleep at the switch to to do that. But of course you can. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, Does that have a uh, stick shaker or a pusher? No. Really? Okay. No, the stall characteristics were demonstrated all the time. People got used to it, there's no no roll off or no uh, bad things, it just buffets and does set up a pretty good sink rate. Really? And you can get into a wing level sink rate is eye watering. Really? <laughs> but very easy to, to get out of. I mean, you know, just a little bit of power and it just flies right out of it. Right. So. Uh, there's another thing that I wanted, oh, the, uh, I remember asking you one time about what's the maximum forward angle that you can land or have the nacelles without getting a, a ground strike. About 45 degrees, I think. Yeah. Um, but he, I remember you telling me that it was, so, it was so fast that there's no way you can land it even at that. Yeah, there, there's too much residual thrust. Really? And so. To land this thing, you, you really want to be back at 90 degrees, and you, you make a run on landing at you know 40, 50 knots at 90 degrees, and you're in very comfortable translational lift all throughout that that procedure. And then as soon as you get on the ground, you know you move the nacelles to the full aft position, and they become a break, aerodynamic break. Kind of so. How far aft will they go? I mean, to go to like uh, yeah. six degrees. Oh, wow. I think as I remember. Yeah. That's some good reverse thrust. Yeah, there's there's some reverse thrust there. Uh, not really, that may not be totally correct, but it's like four to six degrees back around there. Yeah, but it's uh, it's very very noticeable in a hover. You know. And, really? Yeah, when you're in a hover and you change the nacelle angle. To full F, then the nose of you're sitting still, hovering, with the nacelles full F, so your nose is down, and it gives you potential for landing on slopes and stuff like that is is really improved because you can change the the uh, attitude of the fuselage landing gear really? to match the terrain you're gonna land on. Oh wow! Yeah. What well, that's what a neat design. Yeah, well, it's just one of those maneuverability things, you know. Now, see, what if there's a necessity to hover and then fly backwards? Would you have the missiles at 90 degrees and then just pull back on the stick to pitch the nose up? I mean, how would that work? Well, that's the way a helicopter guy would do it. Right. But a tow rotor guy would move his nacelles. Oh, really? Yeah. It turns out that... Would the nose still point down? Or stay level and just tilt the nacelles back. Just tilt the nacelles back. Really? And and you'd be surprised at how quick that response is. Really? And so the idea of flying a tilt rotor is is vectoring your thrust in the direction that you want to go. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go forward, you know, you move your vector forward. So the thrust vector is the is perpendicular to the rotor tip path plane. So you move the tip path plane forward, and your thrust vector is forward, and that's the way you're going. And you want to keep a level fuselage attitude. Helicopter guys are so used to always flying 
by moving the side plate, you're moving the nose forward, tilting the rotor, which tilts the fuselage, and, and then add power, and, and then that, that, that takes you forward. In the tilt rotor, you forget, forget about your right hand. You know, throw your right hand away, or take your right hand off that stick. Yeah. Just, you're using the nacelles to vector your thrust. Where, where was the control knob, lever, whatever, in order to move the nacelles? Where, where it's was on, it's on the thrust lever. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that's your vector thrust there. Uh, that's moving it forward is uh, increasing that vector okay. in length and magnitude. And then moving the nacelles is giving it you know, the azimuth direction, okay. forward or back for any intermediate position. You know, and, and you look at guys who start flying and first thing, natural inclination if they're a helicopter guy is they're trying to fly it like a helicopter so the fuselage is bobbing and bending. Okay. But as they become more familiar with it, they're using them themselves all the time. And, and you see experienced guys flying it. The fuselage is almost always level, and then the cells are moving, and the helicopter or the B-22 is, is moving around with a level level attitude. Right. So it improves your visibility. It's more comfortable for people in the back. You're not being uh, rocked and jostled around by the attitude of the uh, fuselage changing, like in a normal helicopter. Depending on the altitude, and if you get the nacelles for vertical flight at 90 degrees, is there is there any speed at which you can rotate it forward? Does it need to be gradual, or can you just slam it forward and go? If you're lightweight, you can slam them forward. Really? Yeah. Wow. But what's going to happen is that you're going to go up. In the air, you're going to climb rapidly because the efficiency of the air coming off of the rotor going across the wing is going to give you a lot of lift besides pure thrust. Okay. So you you really have to fight it to keep it. If you wanted to do a level acceleration, say at 20 feet, if you're hovering at 20 feet and you want to do a level acceleration at 20 feet. You, know, you start moving the nacelles forward and t to maintain 20 feet as you hit that translational lift you got to pull the power way back okay yeah and, and that that's that's just the way you have to do it but if so if you leave your hover power on and move the nacelles forward you're gonna you know oh, wow. balloon as soon as, as soon as the nacelles get you know 10 15 degrees forward the most efficient takeoff position for the nacelles if you're on the runway is 30 degrees forward. Really? Yeah. Okay. 60 degree nacelle is a magic number. I mean, you sit on the runway, put the nacelles at 60 degrees, uh, hold on the brakes, come on with the power, and you quickly you have to release the brakes because it's gonna it's gonna take off. It'll just jump right out of it. Really? Right off the ground. It's because of the inflow onto the wing, and just it's a it's an amazing takeoff. I mean, you really, really go. For, <laughs> for, so cool for, for a helicopter pilot, it was it was really really neat and, and fun. No wonder that that that's got to be such a good aircraft for special ops, or you know, or just even going into hot zones, so yeah. to say. You know, because I mean, for the for the sake of being uh, how fast it could get out of there. Yes. Now, on the ver on the on the the, ver the the opposite side of that, if you're going 200 knots, we've talked about the acceleration. How about how fast does it slow down? It'll it'll put you into your harnesses. Really? Because if you're, you're, you're in your fixed wing mode and you pull the power all the way back, uh, you know that that's going to accelerate decelerate you pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And then there's a point where the nacelles are going to start converting 
You can do it automatically or you can do it manually. But as soon as you start moving those nacelles back, uh, you know, it, it really slows you down. So slowing down is, is not a problem. We used to think about, well, you know, do we need to slow down five miles out? Uh, but, you know, psh, you can slow down one mile out. Oh, wow. And, which is really, really neat because you can stay hot all the way in. You stay, you're, yeah. you're coming in fast. But you have to do it, that's a maneuver you have to do visually. You couldn't do it, uh, you know, flying uh, on uh, uh, radar. Okay. Yeah, if you're in train following radar mode or something like that, that, that would be a, a challenge. So you said that, that the nacelles, if you didn't manually put them in, they would automatically do it. So if, like, if you're a forward flight, chop the, chop the throttle, they would eventually by themselves just start rotating yes. vertical. Yeah. Wow, really? Wow. Yeah, okay. that's a, a feature in the flight control system that okay. just prevents you from stalling. Sure. Yeah. So that you have to override that to stall. Oh really? Yeah. And uh, so there, there's there's a lot of nice things in the airplane that will, will do that. One of the uh, interesting things was our first operational test with the military. They wanted to come in and start flying the airplane, and some of the things they wanted to do was land navigation. Uh, you know, fly to point A, point B, C, D, and uh, they were all really good guys and they had a lot of helicopter experience and so they brought their maps that they had grown accustomed to uh, and these were helicopter routes that they had flown before so they wanted to fly parallel helicopter to V-22 routes and you know they talked to us about this little test they want to do, and I said, "Well, here, this won't work because you'll be covering the ground way too fast. You'll never see the checkpoints, and you'll never know where you are." Wow. So, yeah, they they said, "Well, we're from the military. You, know, you don't tell us how to, <laughs> how to do our test." <laughs> but you were from the military too. I flown the Tilburger, and I, I knew what they were getting into. Yeah. So, they went out there and you know, they, they flew one at uh, like 100 knots and they were in, flying the tip rotor transition mode all the time. Uh -huh. uh, very inefficient way to do it, but you know, it can be done. You can fly all day in some intermediate nacelle position. Yeah. Not hurt the airplane, but you're just not. It's going through the gas. <laughs> going through the gas, <laughs> making a lot of noise. <laughs> But when you put it over an airplane mode, then you're flying as an airplane. Sure. And then, then you're up at 200 plus and screaming along. And uh, you're following the electronic navigation, you know, it's taking you, you know, point A, B, and C. Oh, wow. And they were, they were shocked. They, they were just flying by these checkpoints. They didn't even have a chance to realize they were there. And really? They, they were past them and, you know, they, they so they realized then that they had to change their way of thinking about, yeah. about the airplane. Yeah. What's the V&E? Oh, it's over 300 knots. Oh, really? I think we, we were up over 300 many times, but we... Uh, it's over 300 knots. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fast. Yeah, we, of course, we were going downhill. Sure. Did you ever do any spin testing? Uh, we were never able to get it to, to spin. Really? I, I, they may have done some after I left the program, but I don't, I don't think it's anything that you could do beyond the tilt rotors. You know, not really a, an airplane, so mm -hmm. didn't really apply. Okay. Yeah. But we had guys that would it's been, it's done acrobatic maneuvers before. You know, rolls and things like that. So well, you was that Osprey? Yeah, yeah. Really? You can roll it really easy. But I mean, what other kind of aerobatic maneuvers were that you know of have been done, like loops or things like that? Not that I know of. Oh really? Yeah, I'm sure some people 
You never know what those, <laughs> brains, are, what those brains are gonna do. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we, yeah, uh, you know, we were always within the Navy envelope. Right. And, you know, everything we did was on telemetry. And, you know, there's no sure. No hanky panking around there. Well, there was no horses around. It was it was all business. Yeah. Yeah. Which was uh, amazing to see the. Uh, yeah, we were we were in a mode of. Uh, trying to make good use of our our flight test time, get the, oh, get sure. the job done. And it was always enlightening to see the young Marines come in and they would go through a transition program and fly the simulators. Uh, and before long, you know, they were they were thinking, what can I do with this airplane? And and that's where the real that's where the airplane pays for itself mm -hmm. because those guys are doing things with it that we hadn't envisioned from what I hear there you know it just extended the reach mm -hmm. of everything they've done I think that goes with any aircraft yes yeah I mean you being, you being a test pilot you've proved the concept yeah. and learned a lot of say hey don't do this do this and so forth and then they had that knowledge walking into the program and so I, I remember the environment that I grew up in, you know, in Vietnam days and stuff like that. But that's a different world nowadays. Oh, and, sure. And they have different equipment, they have different missions, they, and they're always thinking outside the box on how to, how to be more efficient, how to, how to do the job right. And the tilt rotor, you know, is a quantum leap over any helicopter, and they can do things that, you know, we've never thought of. Which is, which is great. You know, medical evacuation is probably one of the life-saving things. You know, we've always done medevacs and helicopters. And, yeah. you know, in Vietnam, it was interesting. We'd do medevacs, and if the guy was a heat stroke, you know, and we had to fly, say, 50 miles back to the hospital or something like that, instead of flying at, you know, 1,000, 2,000 feet, you know, we'd go to five, 6,000 feet. Cool them off. Cool them off. Yeah. Yeah. And possibly save a life. Mm -hmm. But a tilt rotor, you know, you can you can go to those altitudes uh, quickly, very quickly, uh, for that. Or the most amazing thing is that you can cover that same distance in a, no time at all that we did in sure. helicopter. So you get the guy to the hospital quickly. And, you know, every minute that you cut off in that that golden mm -hmm. hour, yep, to get him to a hospital, or get them to the right hospital. Uh, so the tilt rotor offers the benefit of maybe consolidating a multitude of hospitals into just a couple. And then that way you don't have that many hospitals in the theater. You can have fewer hospitals, better equipped. <clears throat> and then the tilt rotor can reach those places mm -hmm. where a helicopter can't really do it efficiently or takes too long really cutting into the guy's chance to survive. And that, that we start talking about saving lives and the Marines, Army, guys on the ground realize that then it becomes a, a game changer for people's support mm -hmm. for the program. I saw an interview with a, uh, uh, at the time probably still is maybe a current B-22 pilot. And they asked him why he chose the B-22 and he said well he goes I wanted to oh, and, you know, he, he was just everything looked interesting about it but he goes I wanted to be close to the ground and he goes and that just had the best flying characteristics out of anything, anything going anything yeah. in the air you know and uh, I, just, I just thought it was really cool how he he wanted to be flying but be close to the ground for support yeah. reasons and I, 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 I got a lot of admiration for that well I think that's a very common in marine pilots uh, Marine Corps always has a slogan you're a rifleman first mm -hmm. you know doesn't make a difference if you're f-18 pilot or you're a, a pilot or a <clears throat> admin clerk whatever you're a rifleman first mm -hmm. you know everybody in the Marine Corps maintains that rifle pistol uh, capability and the whole mission of everybody is support the guy on the ground yep. and 
the B-22 offers a, you know, I'm speaking like a salesman, but it, it does offer a quantum leap over what they've had in the past. So I think a lot of people know this, some people might not, but for the Marine, to be a pilot in the Marine Corps, you've got to go through all the survival training, all that, I mean, you've got to learn how to be the grunt first, just like you said, your rough one first, but, you know, and you got to go through all that basic training, you, you don't walk in as a pilot with wings and stuff like that, I mean, you are just... Your your infantry, and then you basically, and then you transition into into, into being a pilot. Basically, yeah. is that right? Uh, th that's that's basically the way it is now. Of course, I went through all that in the Vietnam era, so I, I didn't go through all. I went through OCS, but I didn't go through the uh, basic school, which was oh, okay. which was uh, six months of of learning how to be a ground officer first. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that that shortchanged me a little bit from understanding guys on the ground, but I you know, picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. You know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, think there's a strong bond. Sure. And, uh, one of the things that we felt very positive about in our <clears throat> development program was, is this the best program for the Marine Corps? I mean, I, re I remember being asked many times by senior general officers who knew knew me and knew I was a Marine and still was a Marine even though I was working for a, a company at that time. They'd take me aside and say, are we doing the right thing? Are, yeah. Is this aircraft going to be worth it? And I said, well, dollar and cents wise, I don't know, but it is the best flying machine I've ever flown and it has the most potential that I've ever seen in any aircraft to do this kind of mission. How much money do you have? Uh, I don't know. It's expensive. I was going to ask you, uh, out of all the aircraft that you've flown, which one? Well, you know, the, I've, yeah, I've flown helicopters and I've flown some fixed wing, mm -hmm. but to do this mission, you know, this is the best, mm -hmm. hands down. I mean, the CH-53 is wonderful. Uh, helicopter, Black Hawk, really nice, you know, neat little Jeep to run around in. The 53, like I said, is a big helicopter. It's fast, well, nowhere near as fast as a B-22. And it can carry a big load, but boy, it is a big helicopter to work around. Which can carry more, that or the 22? Oh, uh, the 53 can carry more. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. 53 can external, you know, 30,000 pounds. Wow. Big load. But boy, you better watch out. Because really, yeah. the downwash of that thing <laughs> will we'll blow you into Kansas. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be careful. It's a, a big machine. But, you know, they all offer their capabilities, but the tilt rotor, I mean, in years to come, I think we'll see different variants come out and you know uh, commercial wise I just think it's got a long ways to go because of the cost sure you know and, and people worry about cost per seat mile and blah 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 mm -hmm. just haven't got there yet need to do some more more work different technologies different composites different need to get away from the uh, uh, you know, just come up with different mass production kind of things right. to do. Out of your entire military career, flying career, and you know, flying in Vietnam, flying with the presidents, flying the B-22, I mean, what, what are some of the biggest things that you've gotten out of the Marine Corps, just flying in general, or just out of, from, from your career, what are some of the most beneficial things that you got out of it? Well, I, I would say in Vietnam was very frustrating at times. Uh, got really tired of taking this hill and then six months later going back and taking the same hill again with big raids. And, you know, we were there without, a, without an end in sight you know, because we weren't projecting ourselves to finish the fight and move into an area and just take over 
everything and control it. Uh, we didn't have the people. That... So then, flying medevac and flying, you know, the extracts and getting people out of bad situations was really uplifting. I felt like I was really doing something worthwhile. You know, then uh, later on, you know, using, uh, lucky enough to bring the tow rotor, not the tow rotor, but the V, the uh, Sidewinder into uh, the helicopter community. And that was just a matter of being at the right place, China Lake, where they developed that kind of technology and bringing it together with the helicopter and making a system work. Side one to work on a helicopter, and then you know nowadays the uh, world has changed. You know we, we no longer worry about the hind helicopter and the Russian front and helicopter, helicopter air warfare. You know that that's gone. So nowadays uh, I felt like I've done something really worthwhile and helping did my small part in bringing the V twenty two forward. I think uh, a lot of lives will be saved, a lot of people will benefit from that kind of aviation uh, technology so that the B-22 can carry more people faster, farther, keep people out of trouble, uh, and save, save lives in the medevac arena. So that's, that's what makes me sleep with a smile on my face. You know? yeah. That's, You've had a really colorful career. Yeah. You really have a very rich career. Yeah, it was it was fun. It really was. Uh, and you know, flying the president of the United States and having him, uh, you know, he and his wife get on board. I know Nancy was uh, always very very reluctant to fly, and uh, you know, we'd be flying from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara on a foggy, foggy night, and we'd be up over the fog uh, from Los Angeles flying to Santa Barbara, and she'd say, I can't see the ground. How are we going to get there? And, you know, and Ronnie would stroke her feet and say, relax, they'll get there. Uh, when you hear that story later on from the aide who was sitting in the back of the helicopter, you know, you say, well, I did good, you know. Yeah, so you got so, in there. So yeah, I got in there, and people would be confident in the fact that you know they could go because you know you know HMX was flying the helicopters. You know, there were many guys in in the squadron who could do the same thing I could do. I mean, any Marine pilot could do it. <clears throat> I was just lucky enough to be be there at that mm -hmm. time and able to be uh, selected, so no special characteristics, but just special times mm -hmm. and special memories. But I was just lucky enough to be in some good places at the right time. Yeah. It's just neat to think about it in a, in a very basic nutshell. You know, fl flying in combat in Vietnam, fly for the president, Learning how to shoot rockets, <laughs> you know, or missiles, rocket, you know, what, missiles, missiles, like, yeah, you know, missiles off helicopters. Going back to flying the president, and then into the test pilot program for the V twenty two. I mean, it's it's just it's just awesome to to think about all the stuff that you did. This is really 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 neat. Well, the only thing I really think about now is my handicap, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like. <laughs> it, it, it has been down to eight, and <laughs> so yeah. But that that's very nice of you to bring that up. I never thought about it. I really don't. Well, I thank you for your service. I, I, I thank God every day for uh, the country I live in and the people I know, and the opportunities I've had. So, so I think God has been good to me. So. Well, God's been good to me, but I think men like you have been good to this country. So. I think it's a combination between the two. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Donations can be made to the Veteran Tales Project on our website at VeteranTalesProject.com. Thank you for watching.